Mary, ready when you are. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining our Thursday afternoon, morning, lunchtime or evening dial-in, depending on, on where you're calling from. Um, this has become a bit of a habit of open democracies um, under lockdown. Um, uh, I think probably most of you know know who we are and what we do, um, but um, Open Democracy is an online uh, global media platform that uh, seeks to challenge power and inspire change. Um, we do fantastic, awesome investigative journalism um, led by many of the people on this call. Um, we do serious comment analysis and debate. Um, and um, every week we host a discussion about some of the things that uh, we've been considering uh, in our work and our lives. Um, today, we're going to be talking about, um, again, coronavirus and how it's changing how we live, but also how we feel and what we think. Um, one of the key reflections that, come, that has come out uh, for Open Democracy as a team amongst many of us has been that it's easy for us all to say how the world should change after coronavirus or how coronavirus is changing the world, how other people should change and realize they were wrong about certain things. Um, based on all our pre-existing certainties. So we think that there should be action on climate change. Well, we're all gonna learn that we should fly less as a result of this crisis. Um, many of us uh, already think that um, healthcare is a public good and, and should be invested in more heavily. Well, the governments are gonna learn they need to spend more on, on healthcare. Um, you know, governments are gonna learn that the universal basic income is something that they have to do. Um, it's very easy for us to tell the people what they're getting wrong and um, to argue with people we disagree with. Um, about things that we were sure of long before this crisis ever happened. Um, a harder thing for all of us to do is to admit what are we changing our minds about. It's an incredibly hard thing for any human being to admit they're wrong or that they've changed their mind about something. Um, and here I'm going to add a plug for the, um, the depolarization uh, project. Um, one of the, our participants, Ali Goldsworthy, runs the, the depolarization project, um, which focuses a lot on um, how and why and when people change their mind. And there's indeed a podcast all about this. So um, go check out the depolarization project.com. Um, but uh, we wanted to uh, bring these kind of internal reflections and, and conversations uh, we've been having and, and share them uh, uh, with our readers and viewers and and hear what you have to say about this too. So um, the first thing to say about all these calls is we want this conversation to involve you. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions and comments ahead of time. We're going to try and address as many of them as we can. Uh, if you're joining us on Zoom and you have a question or comment, you can click on the chat uh, icon at the bottom of your screen, type into the chat window. Um, uh, similarly, if you're joining from Facebook, you can do um, add comments or questions and this will be fed back. You, you'll find that your microphones are muted, that's so people can talk one at a time, but we'll unmute you if um, we're calling on you for a contribution and um, all the comments uh, and input will be fed to me. Uh, one final thing to say before we get started, this is an evolving experiment. Um, my two young kids are downstairs and they may come in and interrupt us at some point. Um, Adam has a very cute dog that sometimes get, gets overexcited. Um, this very much <laughs> recreates the atmosphere of uh, open democracy editorial meetings and lockdown. So uh, it's informal and slightly chaotic and slightly unplanned and, and unscripted at times. Um, but we hope that, that you'll enjoy it and, and you'll get something from it. Um, I'm going to start first uh, with Laurie McFarlane, who um, is uh, Open Democracy's economics editor and co-author of critically acclaimed book, Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing. Um, Laurie, uh, you told us the other day that your thinking is evolving uh, on the EU, on the European Union. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm always someone who's believed in the basic idea of the European Union, but um, been very critical of its basic institutional architecture, which I think from the beginning is, has been kind of hardwired to exacerbate social and, and economic inequalities. And obviously, in recent years, we've seen this put to the test really with the Eurozone crisis, where we saw the problems um, in, in this architecture resulting in brutal austerity in some member states, um, and of course, to some extent with Brexit. Um, despite all of that, though, I still maintain, I think, a, a narrow belief, a uh, bit of faith that the European project could overcome this and ultimately uh, thrive. Um, but I, I suppose I'm sad to say that I think the coronavirus has made me reassess that somewhat um, in the sense that once again, we've seen it's revealed the fault lines at the heart of the European Union, particularly between the North and South. And instead of seeing the kind of solidarity and political will necessary to kind of overcome these issues, 
we've really seen a doubling down on the hardened positions, which are really only going to make things much, much worse. So we've seen the so-called frugal four, Germany, the Netherlands, Austria and Finland, balk at the idea of euro bonds, which would uh, basically enable all member states to borrow funds on the same terms to fight uh, the crisis. And, and we've seen this already, evidence that this is generating quite a furious backlash across the continent. Polls indicating in Italy that faith in the European Union has, has collapsed by up to 20%. Um, and so for me, this has really brought home, I think, the, uh, this kind of sad reality for me that um, the question, I think, for, for the EU is not whether it can thrive now, but sadly, whether, whether it can really survive. Um, I'm afraid I have my doubts. Gosh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's bleak. Um, and, uh, but to your point, um, uh, one of the questions that was uh, submitted bef before this call um, was from Miklos, who said, why is the union unable to apply disciplinary measures against Viktor Orban's illiberal anti-union government? So you've mentioned a lot of failings there when it comes to economic um, and fiscal solidarity um, and, and inequalities of, of, of power. Um, there's the other, so another uh, huge concern is, of course, um, the illiberal crackdown that's, come, that's going on in a number of, of EU countries in which we discussed last week. Um, and actually, if you want to hear more about the way that uh, coronavirus is enabling or uh, acting as a pretext um, for uh, power grabs, authoritarian power grabs across the world. You can sign up to our newsletter if you haven't already, uh, opendemocracy.net forward slash corona crackdown. Um, but this question is specific about Orban and the EU's seeming hesitance or reticence to um, speak out um, and act um, when he's effectively made himself the dictator of Hungary in various different stages. Um, could you speak a bit, a bit to that? And then Adam, I also wanted to come to you on this. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's two things here. I mean, the first thing to say is I think that Orban uh, is often uh, quite clever about the way that he's doing things, which is really stretching the rules without necessarily uh, over or is quite conscious about trying not to overstep them. But the second thing I think to say is that despite on the surface being a, a, an entity, the EU, that is a rules-based bloc in practice, uh, it is it's not really, uh, it's much more operates according to its internal power dynamics and EU laws and rules are, uh, you know, not sort of permanent lines in the sand, but they're off, always being bent, broken, contested, revised, ignored, particularly by the larger, more powerful states. And actually one thing, I think people don't often recognize is that the, the state that breaks the rules the most by far more than anyone else you know it's not hungary it's not greece it's germany by far um, and yet nothing happens um, and with hungary it's an interesting case because it plays a, a very important role in european supply chains uh, and particularly uh, in germany's economy um, and so when it actually comes down to cracking down on this kind of thing, it's not necessarily when the EU, how it actually works, it's not necessarily, you know, black and white, are they breaking the rules or not? It's much more, does the, the sort of balance of power within the EU think it's a good idea to crack down on it right now or not? Um, and I think at the moment, um, that certainly seems to be the answer is no right now. Thanks, Laurie. Um, uh, Adam uh, Ramsey, I wanted to come to you next. Adam Ramsey is um, a UK-based editor based in Edinburgh um, and also um, involved in, in lots of uh, awesome climate activism, including People and Planet. Um, and um, Adam, you had, you've you spent a lot of time in Hungary recently, actually, and you had some thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that what's fascinating is you compare the way the EU treated Greece when it broke some fiscal rules or was talking about breaking some fiscal rules in 2015 with the way that it treated Hungary more recently. And it's a pretty depressing story. And, and I think Laurie is exactly right that you travel around Hungary, the most kind of obvious thing you see on the edge of every town and city is the car factories that, you know, these famous German car manufacturers outsource their production of the kind of lower level, lower skill level um, manufacturing of cars to Hungary and, and other countries in the former Eastern Bloc. And they rely very heavily on <coughs> regimes like Orban's regime to drive down wages through their author authoritarian <coughs> regime. So although they will complain kind of about, in theory, the less democratic aspects, in, in effect, the German economy is reliant on this sort of uh, fairly robust regime in Hungary, and they never go too far in disciplining them. 
Thank you, Adam. Uh, yeah, um, Ian says, Laurie, you are right. Neoliberalism is locked into the structure of the EU. It needs to become democratic to survive federated. Um, and there are other uh, comments there um, agreeing with, with the key points uh, that you've made. I also wanted to flag up that um, Laurie's got a very, very interesting, uh, long, thoughtful piece um, published today on Open Democracy, um, which is uh, the basic summary is from coronavirus to climate change, China is surging ahead of the US and its allies. Are we witnessing the slow death of liberal capitalism? Um, Adam's going to put a link to um, to that really thoughtful, um, uh, thought provoking piece in in both chats. And um, the next week's dial in discussion is actually a discussion about that. So um, do have a read of that and and tune in if if you if you'd like to hear more. Um, now I'm, we're now going to go to Cape Town and to um, Kerry Cullinan, who's Open Democracy's global health editor, and she works specifically on tracking the backlash, which is the project which tracks um, the backlash against rights of women's and LGBTQI people across the world. Um, um, now, Kerry, um, in contrast to Laurie on the EU, your thinking uh, seems like it's going in the opposite direction on the African Union. You didn't used to be much of a fan, but now explain. Well, the African Union has generally been a bit of a money waster, really. A lot, um, the talk shop and hasn't um, achieved much, mostly, I think, because a lot of African countries depend on, on donor aid. So they're all competing with one another to woo the donors. But somehow with COVID-19, I think um, the continent has realized that they have to get their act together because, the, you know, the continental blocks and the usual allies are busy helping themselves. So there's been an extraordinary alignment and, and very good working together, mostly through a technical committee called the Africa CDC, the Center for Disease um, Control, based in Addis Ababa. And they are negotiating directly with China for um, procurement of all kinds of personal protective e equipment, PPE and um, tests and so on directly with China to buy for the whole continent. They, they've they um, set up a fund um, to, to help countries that can't help themselves. There's six countries in Africa that don't even have ventilators, not one ventilator at all. So they are um, the South African companies that are starting to make ventilators um, and they're going to redistribute them. And it's been really extraordinary to see this coming together of what didn't used to work before. And now suddenly um, they, they, they really are getting their act together. Tomorrow they're launching something called the Partnership for um, Expanding COVID-19 Testing and they're rolling out testing all over the continent and they bought the reagent um, for the tests directly from China. And it's gonna be trying to stimulate local or content African companies to make tests and ventilators and all kinds of things. So yes, pleasantly surprised. Thank you, that sounds a lot better than the response that's going on uh, in, in our country. I'm, I'm dialing in from London in the UK and uh, it sounds like we are way behind. Um, uh, so I wanted to come next to um, Lydia Namaburu, who um, is also um, dialing in from Africa, from Kampala. Um, she's Open Democracy's Africa editor, and she also works on, on tracking the backlash. Um, uh, Lydia, joining us from Kampala, you have some interesting reflections on the role that African strongmen, i.e. dictators, are playing at this moment. Um, can you tell us a bit more? Yeah. Um... So for a long time, you know, I've had really clear feelings about, you know, strong men, which is, I didn't like them, I did not see any place for them in the world, and I saw them as evil. Uh, but the, res the response of the leadership uh, shown uh, by people, by strong men like Yoweri Museveni here in Uganda, or Paul Kagame in, in Rwanda, was making me think, well, they don't, they may not be long, there, there may be just one moment in modern life where that is their moment. And it, it is this moment when we're not talking about complex governance and democracy concepts, we're talking about a simple thing, lead a nation to counter a very simple thing like, do, you know, uh, avoiding an infectious disease. So um, the, they are, strong men tend to be very, paternalistic in their leadership, but also African societies are very often very patriarchal in their recognition of authority. And so in this moment when you just need 
and someone to lead the people. They are proving this moment. Is, this moment is proving to be their point, their their, their moment, and that's uh, so. Uh, but also, um, also, I have uh, as you know, we a lot of them started off as revolutionaries, as liberators, and over time we've been really, really disillusioned with them. What happened to them? And this moment is making me think. Well, they are still leaders. There's still people who care about their, their their people, and perhaps just leading a country uh, in normal times when you need to approach it in a more complex manner just was out of their depth. So yeah, I sort of feel like they're not evil. They were just out of their depth in normal times and in simple simple times such as these where the task is single and easy to articulate you know they they are leaders can you say yeah can you say a bit more about um either in the in the case of, of uganda or rwanda um um both have quite complicated uh, strong men in, in charge um yeah. can you say a bit more about um what distinguishes the the response that they're able to to lead in in this moment and 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 also, really, the, 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 I mean, we're all familiar with these, but um, the context of, um, you know, the, the very repressive other uh, measures that they brought in. I remember being in, in uh, Kigali in, I think it was 2010, um, when, as a foreign journalist, we were all assured that Paul Kagame wouldn't be running again, and, and he, that he subsequently won the next vote by 93%, and, you know, is, uh, has, has continued on ever since. So <laughs> it'd be good both for you to reflect on how their, um, how their leadership has been repressive, um, the, the negative impacts it had, but also what has distinguished the response that they, they, they've been able to, um, to lead in this moment. Yeah, I think I think both Kagame and Museveni, like you say, are complex, uh, a, a bit more complex as dictators than many others. In that, even though at the end of the day, no matter how the vote swings, they will take the vote. They do make effort to have a relationship with the uh, with the with the population with the, with with the, with the voters. So they do go through. Um, they, we, we, are, we go to elections every few years. They make a real effort of campaigning, traversing the country, making promises which they may or may not deliver on, um, which in normal times always felt like just a complete waste of, um, of public resources. But in a time, I mean, if you're going to have a leader, it turns out one who has some amounts of rapport with the with 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 the, with the citizens is better than I mean the alternative, which is a dictator who doesn't who, who is also you know hugely unpopular. Uh, but that's that said, I, I mean, and I think uh, we have to keep perspective, which is they are still repressive, and the. They may save us from this one crisis. They may, uh, but at the, all of the other crises that they have created, that they have engineered, in order to stay in power, remain. So we still will have to remove them after they led us, <laughs> after they they they've led us away from uh, a public health crisis. Thank you. Um, uh, and, and so there's a follow up question here, which someone um, else asked, which um, I'm actually going to bring to you. So we, um, someone asked, how have previous pandemics changed social, political, economic norms in the UK? And um, actually, um, that's something that perhaps we could all discuss later. We don't have uh, amongst the panel. There aren't any real uh, clear answers on, on that one. Um, but the question did um, make me reflect on something you pointed out, Lydia, a few days ago, which is, um, the, the potential crowding out effect that this um, pandemic is having on other really serious, grave, long-term health ep epidemics and health challenges and problems. So 6% of Ugandans cu currently live with HIV and only 75% have access to antiretroviral -ret drugs, which means that people are still dying of this disease in, um, in completely unacceptable numbers. Um, can you say a bit more about um, what the focus or attention on coronavirus is is potentially doing to those other really um, important problems? 
Yeah, and and I think, I, and yeah, and, and this is important uh, for people who are in the business of communication, which is to keep keep balancing the conversation with all of the other things. So Uganda, in Uganda right now, 1.4 million people. So 6% is about 1.4 million people living with HIV. And yet, at least for the past uh, many weeks, all public health effort has been thrown at uh, the coronavirus and containing its, its spread. Yet the government tells us there's only 55 confirmed cases, but oh, we are under lockdown. A lot of people, a lot of those people, even the 75% who have access, who had access to uh, ARVs cannot leave their houses. Public transport is banned. Private transport is banned. You cannot leave home to go to hospital to get a refill for your, you know, of, of ARVs. And that's true also for other existing uh, big killers, malaria, maternal health, and all of those. All of those are being exasperated in this sort of monomaniacal um, effort to to prevent a new threat which yes we are most scared about because we don't understand it as well as we understood the other but yeah i do think we both uh, at local levels but also globally we need we need to keep like uh, zooming out to this isn't the only threat uh and that and responses to it should not be should yeah should 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 not be blind to all of the other threats. Thank you. And um, Lydia has um, a really powerful piece which is being published um, on Saturday, which uh, absolutely makes this point, um, uh, but but also speaks to um, the dangers of uh, replicating massive power imbalances in terms of who has access to uh, coronavirus treatment and who gets involved in trials um, to find vaccines and to find cures. It's really powerful, it's incredibly moving. I actually cried when I read, read it and I would highly recommend you read her piece on Saturday. Um, you can sign up to opendemocracy.net forward slash newsletter if you haven't already and, and you'll see Lydia's piece on, on Saturday. Um, I'm coming next to Claire Provo, who's um, dialing in from Turin in Italy um, and uh, is uh, the lead editor, our, our global investigations editor, working specifically on tracking the backlash again with uh, Lydia and Kerry. Um, she's also worked with The Guardian and the Centre for Investigative Journalism. Um, and um, Claire, tell us what you've changed your mind on. You've gone back and forth on this bit. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm not sure if I've changed my mind yet but I, I i do have um something i would like to share and i would love to get also thoughts on this from people in um who have dialed in so i've had a, i've long had concerns and and i think kind of an instinctual opposition to experts and to experts gaining increased authority and decision making power in democracies along the lines of like what does it mean for a democracy if important decisions that affect our lives that are deeply political are being made by unelected people, many steps removed from us. I, um, I don't have access to them in the same way I might to my MP. I already feel removed from my parliament. So experts, well, more so has sort of been the instinctual thought process. Um, but sitting in lockdown in Northern Italy after many weeks, I'm really glued to the TV screen, um, like when the WHO talks or when our national scientists talk, that's who I want to hear from, not our politicians. And I'm, I'm worried about, for example, politicians being lobbied by industries to reopen or to never close factories and, and some businesses in the first place. Many Italian factories are still open. Um, and you know, I've, asked, I've been asking myself things like, would I rather like an unelected WHO style body to like, but with a mandate for, to, focused on health and human rights, but I prefer them to like, manage this lockdown and tell me when I can start leaving my house or uh, then politicians and the police. And, and I think the answer is maybe yes, you know, and, and so I'm not sure if I've completely changed my mind about experts and democracies in the long run, but in this case, I have noticed myself thinking this, hmm, I think I prefer the unelected body here, which is a weird thing for me to notice myself thinking. 
Well, particularly as you guys recently had the Liga, the far right Liga party in government and you know, Matteo, Matteo Salvini is as a deputy prime minister. So I can I can absolutely relate to that. And I can absolutely relate to that based based on our leadership here in the UK as well. Um, another question for you, uh, Claire, which was submitted by Stephanie. Um, which was, uh, what thoughts do you have on the impact of coronavirus on um, uh, the rollback of women's rights globally? And this is something um, that you and many of the colleagues have been publishing um, a lot on recently. So you could just touch on some of the key points and pieces that have, have come out recently um, on this. That would be great. Um, yeah, well, uh, this week we wrote um, an op-ed, for example, for Al Jazeera that did look at, at, this, at this question and also how um, as Lydia mentioned, there are long standing crises that are being um, uh, exacerbated right now or that people are maybe noticing now that they hadn't noticed before. Um, women have always done most of the world's care work, paid and unpaid. I, um, I, I, but while you know, some ultra conservatives, we are seeing how that they, they are celebrating how the home and the family are now at the center of everything again. Um, but there are some people that are finding things that they that they like in this moment, um, how women are back at the home, uh, how um, abortions are harder to get, uh, how more unwanted pregnancies may be carried to term with women's reproductive choice like really massively curtailed. We hear people saying things like, we're all trad wives now. But, um, but I, 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 on this point, you know, it is true in many ways that the family and the home are at the center of many people's experiences of this pandemic, under lockdown in particular. But this is actually a scary thing for many people, for example, in domestic violence situations for LGBT people who might not find solace and acceptance in these places. Um, and I just wanted to also plug um, the series that my colleague Carrie, um, who you just heard from, is curating called Humans of COVID that tells some of these stories. Thank you very much. And yeah, another reason to follow us, uh, sign up to our newsletter, opendemocracy.net forward slash newsletter, because we're launching a really um, powerful um, project next week, which uh, tells the story of people most um, who are already the most vulnerable and marginalized um, and um, tells, uh, tells us how um, COVID is, is impacting them in their own words, you know, unfiltered. Um, uh, someone added here about the WHO, that, but the but the World Health Organization is political. It refuse its refusal to listen to acknowledge Taiwan has been a problem. Uh, definitely, I think that 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 is a, that is a really important point, and I think probably Claire, that's part of the reason that that Claire um, has some skepticism of experts because no, you know. Um, everybody, everyone, every institution, every person is is, is um, political and comes um, comes with a framework um, to any question or problem. Um, on the other hand, it's a question of how how much of a problem is is each respective institution or body. Um, do either Claire, I was thinking either Claire or you, Adam, would want to speak more about to to the World Health Organization and its its politicization and of course in the context of Trump uh, announcing that he's going to defund it as well. Kerry as well, anyone who wants to put their hand up and, and come in on that one. I, I, I mean, I completely agree that these bodies are all political. Um, and uh, one of my, like this has been the source of a lot of my underlying like skepticism about the role of experts too is that they they are experts but they are working on political issues and these are political bodies as well and they're unaccountable in the sense that i don't have a direct representative there in the same way um uh, and in the context of you know trump uh, defunding the who it also comes off the back of um many 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 years of ultra conservative attacks from uh, um, uh, a lot of groups in the us for example against the who so um while it seemed really like a really surprising move to me sitting in Italy right now when the WHO is, is seen as a really serious and important institution in our in our like public debate. Um, it didn't surprise me from the perspective of tracking the backlash against uh, universal rights and um, uh, where the WHO has also been uh, a target of many ultra conservative groups for many, many years. Um, and those ultra conservative groups are now in US uh, delegation. So it wasn't completely a surprise from that perspective. Thank you. Laurie, did you put your hand up as well? Yeah, just uh, very quickly. Um, you know, ultimately, I think when it, what it boils down to is many of these technocratic organisations are ultimately accountable or who, what sort of power are they accountable to? And the reality uh, of the sort of contemporary multilateral system is that um, 
really in practice, the US holds a kind of a veto almost because they're the biggest funder. Um, and we've seen this obviously in the World Health Organization uh, just in the last day. We're also seeing it as it happens with the IMF. Obviously, the IMF is obviously, you know, blatantly in many cases an instrument of US power. Um, but just in the last few days, the IMF has been trying to, with international support, issue what's called special drawing rights. It's basically a kind of quasi money to help the Global South countries respond to the crisis. And again, Trump has basically vetoed it and said, we're not, we're not going to do it. Um, so yeah, I mean, ultimately, this, this balance between technocracy and democracy, ultimately, I think a lot of it comes down to, again, uh, what sort of power are they accountable to? Thank you, Laurie. Yeah, and actually, um, a, a thoughtful comment from Barbara Clark here, which is politicians are for scrutiny, weighing different dis different perspectives for, politi for policy decisions. They're not experts, but experts are not policymakers. We need both doing their jobs with humility. Thank you. I think that's something many of us would, would agree with. Um, so uh, I want to now, so talking about politicization, I wanted to come to an Adam last dialing in from um, Edinburgh. You've written very persuasively about how there's nothing as political as a pandemic, and we can share that link again um, uh, in the chat. Um, but um, you've, this, this moment, this crisis has also prompted you to make some less political uh, reflections, which is very unlike you. It is indeed. I am, um, so for context, I grew up on a hill farm with the result that I have no romantic ideas about growing food whatsoever. It's a painful process, which, you know, leaves you with a sore back and dirty hands, and I've got no interest at all in growing food. But despite that, two weeks ago, I um, practically became potato farmer. I uh, planted a, you know, whole vast number of seed potatoes in my garden for the very simple reason that our local baker is about to shut down because they can't get hold of flour. Um, since the late 70s, supermarkets have built more and more precarious supply chains. And you know, while I didn't stockpile food ahead of Brexit, as many people in the UK did, I think we are quite likely to see an ongoing increase in food prices right across the world, and including here in the UK, where we have very precarious uh, supply chains. And um, while I think that you know, someone like me, lucky enough to have a reasonably stable job, isn't going to go hungry. I certainly think that stocking up on large quantities of bulk carbs in a way that doesn't deny your supermarket the, uh, the pasta that your neighbours might need is probably sensible for all of us to be doing. Thank you very much. Um, so there was a question here which is sort of related um, and, and it's a, a, a conversation uh, we've been having as well, um, which is um, do you think this crisis will encourage us all to focus more on local action and decision making? So, you know, thinking at, at the community, the neighbourhood uh, level, um, and is that a good thing or not? And I, I'm, I think the answer is basically yes or no. So tell us more. Um, so yeah, I keep meaning to write a piece about rainbows and windows, as uh, you know, lots of people in the UK have been seeing on our daily walks, um, being posted up in, by our neighbours, because I think that you know the, the way that um, the neoliberal model works politically is by persuading everyone that everyone else is very aggressive and individualistic and selfish, rather than persuading us actually to be like that ourselves. I used to take people off on kind of canvassing um, uh, expeditions when I was more involved in party politics. And the main reflection people always had was they were astonished to discover that everyone was very nice and they do care about their community and they care about society and they want to know how to contribute. And this sort of idea that everyone else is selfish is really basically a myth. And what's fascinating about the current process is certainly here in Scotland, as far as I can tell across the world, we're seeing displays and windows of people's politics and the kind of solidaristic politics. We're seeing you know, every street pretty much in the UK being organized into kind of mutual aid groups with WhatsApp groups and email groups to help out more vulnerable neighbors and so on. And I think people are reconnecting locally in a way they haven't done for a very long time and discovering actually their neighbors are lovely and progressive and do care about each other and the kinds of things that they care about. And this sort of myth that we're all these sort of selfish individuals and those of us who care about the world are you know, weird and a rarity and, and unusual is gonna be busted. Thank you. Um, uh, there's one more um, thought I want to, to put to all of you panelists and everyone who's dialing in. Um, and I want you to think on this uh, when it bring in uh, Ali Goldsworth in a minute. So uh, in view of the big rethinking of our values and lifestyles, what changes would we would you be able to continue with after lockdown? So um, I'd love everyone to um, to be thinking about that. What's changed in my life? What will I can what what change will continue after this lockdown phase? Um, and I wanted I would love to invite Ali um, 
Gold, Goldsworthy, who's an Open Democracy Board member and, and also um, heads up the Depolarization Project um, out in Stanford, um, to tell us a little bit about why it's hard to change your mind and why often when people do change their mind, it doesn't last. No, it, thanks, Mary. It's been fascinating to listen to this. I suppose the thing is, is when people change their minds rather than change their behavior, they're often changing some of their core values. And that tends to happen much more slowly and over a period of time rather than with just one quick change of behavior. So I'd be very surprised if we saw huge changes in how we operated as a world or as a society over a period because of Corona, much as many of us might hope for that. I think it, it would be unlikely to happen. But a couple of things as people were, were just talking kind of really struck me that people might want to reflect on, which is one, when everybody's talked about changing their mind, they say they've done it because they've had new information or something that's come in that's different rather than being like, actually, previously I assessed something incorrectly and I got it wrong. And it's even harder to admit that you've got something wrong than it is to say that actually there's been new information. And that demonstrates just how difficult it is for us as humans. And I suppose that the second thing that comes from that is how we as people learn or the, everybody listening in on this is how do you respond when someone be a political leader or something else says, actually, I did get this wrong or there's been new information and I've changed my mind. And very often we tend to have a go at them for you turning at that point. And sometimes that's completely the right thing to do from a democratic accountability point of view. I mean, that's why we're all involved in open democracy is to try and help call people to account. But if something new has come in and someone's changed their mind, shouldn't we praise them for that? Shouldn't we think that that's something that makes us more likely to want to work with them rather than less? And that's not really how we operate at the minute. And if a few people started trying to change that narrative and make it more influential, then we might find that some of the changes we want from Corona are more likely to last. Thank you very much. And a thoughtful thing from Stephanie, which was put in the, in the chat, which was, um, I'm a multiple migrant. And I go back and forth compulsively from places to keep in touch with family in place. I think I can now face being in a place, although it's unlikely to be the UK. <laughs> um, and I, I think that uh, certainly um, it's to your point that, um, yes, that this, this situation has pr um, presented us with a new information, which might make us change our mind or, or, or um, a new context, which might make us change our behavior. Um, but I think also uh, that uh, some of these lessons are potentially quite useful and important to learn. I mean, certainly I can say that one thing that will happen after um, coronavirus um, as a policy is that open democracy people will be traveling less because we don't need to be traveling as, as, as much as we are. And this was already something we were conscious of, but being forced into changing your behavior because of circumstance, um, you know, it doesn't, we're not changing our minds. We, we, like, we all believe that climate change is an issue. Um, but our circumstances have, have forced a change in, in behavior, um, uh, which I think is, is potentially useful. Does anyone else want to come in on the, on the um, things that uh, they might continue to live with um, after, after this? Or to Ali's really excellent point about, okay, it's not, I'm not just changing my mind because of new information. I'm, I'm, I, was, I actually realized I was wrong and I'm changing something more fundamentally. Adam. Sure. So um, I was thinking about that quote from the kind of arch neoliberal Milton Friedman, who said that change always comes in a crisis and the change that happens depends on the ideas that are lying around. And the fact that in Britain over the last decade, one of the most powerful cultural events has been the Great British Bake Off. And how because of the idea lying around of baking that, you know, didn't really increase in, as an activity over 10 years in Britain, the response to the crisis in the UK has been that everyone has learned to bake. And there's an astonishing flourishing of baking. And I suspect that will be uh, a phenomenon that continues long after this crisis and certainly will be in my life. I think there's quite a strong incentive to get better at baking though, isn't it? I mean, you get a very quick reward, hopefully, if you're only good at it for, as an incentive. Does anyone else have thoughts about um, either what Ali said? Okay, so it's not just about new information, but it's about how you assess information. Has anyone had anything um, a bit deeper at that level. Um, I'm trying to think myself if I if I have. It's much harder. It's much harder as human beings to 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 go deeper on that on that stuff and admit where it wasn't there so much. You had other information that you didn't have the right information. It's that you were assessing it in a way that you now don't. Claire, come come in. 
I'm I would like to know what Ali thinks about um, the version of changing your mind that is, uh, I didn't think this was important now, uh, before, but I understand how it's important now. Like for example, um, I had, I've read stories and multiple stories in the past about um, people struggling to uh, like afford funerals and um, a decent burial, burials with dignity for family members. And um, I wasn't personally that interested in, 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 in this and I, I, I didn't um, maybe understand, understand the, the importance of uh, burials and, and uh, funerals. Um, and I do now, I, I have a family member who has coronavirus and if something were to happen, we wouldn't have a funeral. And I didn't think that this was important before as much, but, but now I, I might become an activist for you know, burials with dignity. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's um, a really good point, actually. The underlying thing about how people update the information is often down to a personal experience or a personal story. Like, much as we all like to think facts change minds and we're very rational people, you know, there's an awful lot of evidence out there that suggests that's not the case. And it's either coming across someone or directly experiencing it yourself. You're like, oh, like, that's what happens and that's what trumps people saying what's happening on a meta level and it's one of the biggest challenges that exists for politicians is if somebody's had a, a personal experience which is different to the norm by which i mean like the average in this sense it's really hard to appreciate that and to appreciate that you're not normal right and and by dint of the fact that we're all working or involved with open democracy and people listening in none of us are actually terribly normal people in that we're all obsessed with this kind of thing and recognizing that can be a little bit difficult at times and i hope your family member gets better sorry thank you claire thank you i let us realize i was muted there um anthony barnett who's um the founder of open democracy um makes i think a a, a decent point which is um, on Ali's good point, it would be easier to respect politicians who say I got it wrong when you believe they are sincere in the first place. <laughs> um, I wanted to challenge people and uh, everyone here listening in, dialing in and, and contributing and, and on the panel. Um, who, uh, which politicians or leaders um, have been impressive in this moment and, and, and sincere and um, have risen to this moment and acted in ways which um, which should be um, celebrated or acknowledged? Um, because that's something again that's much far harder to do. It's far, you know, it's easy for, for us in, in in our DNA and in, in the way that we that we uh, interact with the world to um, to criticise, but far less easy um, to to celebrate politicians when they do good things. I'm seeing a couple of suggestions coming in. Kerry, um, South Africa's president, Sir Ram Ramaphosa. Um, yeah, just in Arden and in um, uh, New Zealand. Um, uh, uh, Berlin, um, uh, someone's impressed by Ang Angela Merkel's leadership. Um, uh, Carrie, will you say a little bit more about Ramaphosa and the, and the context around that? Um, because South Africa had a run of, of pretty awful leaders. So what's, uh, what's different this time? The big difference is that he's listening to the scientists and he does admit when he's done things that we, when he's got things wrong, I mean, with the lockdown, the lockdown is killing our economy and people are really angry about it. And he said right from the start, we're going to make a lot of mistakes and just bear with us and tell us when we make mistakes. Um, and it's extremely hard to, 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 to balance an economy that's probably, they say it's going to be a negative growth of minus 6% um, when we get back. And, 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 and an illness that people can't quite grasp. But he's managed, I think, to, to, to explain properly and very openly um, the process and um, has regular um, updates. And on, on Monday night, there was an extraordinary three hour open um, session with, with the top scientists. There's a 45 scientist panel, scientific panel that's advising government. And they were on primetime TV and anybody could, 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 could listen and they explained step by step exactly what um, was, um, what was their thinking behind the lockdown. And, and I, th I think that it's, it's, it's helped enormously in, in a country that's struggling massively with, with economic issues. Thank you very much. Uh, Anthony says, I like the way Conte is having a real argument with the EU and seems to be getting somewhere, which loops back to, to Laurie's uh, first point. 
Um, another question which came in and um, which is worth reflecting on, um, what can we do to stem the tide of totalitarian domination post COVID? So a lot of our uh, coverage and discussion um, in previous weeks has focused on the authoritarian power grabs that are happening all over the world. And we touched on this earlier with Hungary. Um, uh, I'm going to give a very um, obvious and slightly self-serving answer here, which is um, you need reliable, trustworthy journalism to expose abuse of power, hold power to account, call out when things are doing wrong, uh, when people and organizations um, are doing wrong um, and, um, and demand change and lift up um, voices and ideas and am amplify those um, pushing for progressive change for accountability. Um, so please do support Open Democracy and other um, um, media outlets that you think are doing this work well at this time. It is absolutely critical. Um, you can support us at supportopendemocracy.net forward slash I think it's support, but actually I might need a colleague to put the, the correct URL in. Um, uh, that's certainly one thing. Uh, yeah, opendemocracy.net forward slash donate. Thank you. That's a much easier um, URL. Um, obviously, the, the support doesn't have to be um, financial monetary, although that does help. But, um, you know, amplifying uh, journalism and reporting and perspectives that you think are trustworthy and reliable um, and ensuring that others hear them and um, um, expressing the need for that in, in as many ways as possible is, is, is vital. Um, has anyone got other ideas about things that, um, that we can do to push back on um, the authoritarian uh, turn um, the world is taking at, at this moment and any idea, any things that you can see that are happening now um, that you think uh, are, in, are encouraging. And, 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 and a writer to that, someone says, did the panel think that there's SDGs um, will have to change the, the sustainable development goals. So either of those questions, if anyone wants to come in on, on any of those. Adam, I know that we've, we've, we've ins relentlessly insisted on promoting good news as well as bad news in our Democracy Watch newsletter. So is there anything else you can pull out for, from that? Lydia has a hand. Yes, I think part of it is we have to resist focusing exclusively on on this one crisis and continue. I think part of what justifies authoritarianism is simplicity, is, uh, is big, uh, allowing ourselves to be swallowed up by this one thing. So I think we have to continue highlighting all of the other things that are, that are happening. But I also think we need to change how we talk about this. A lot of people are talking about this as, as if this is a war, this is a fight, this is a pandemic, uh, but you know, I think language that foregrounds war encourages extreme uh, at all, all extreme measures are, are to be taken at all costs, and that's kind of the fertile ground for authoritarianism. So, zoom out, uh, bring in other perspectives. Keep reporting on things that have nothing to do or with, with COVID or have, you know, are only tangential to COVID. I, I, so, you know, everybody understands everything else is still happening. Mary, Thank you, Lydia. That's really helpful. Um, uh, a very nice comment from Barbara as well saying, gatherings like this, which are proliferating, are great examples of democratic stirring, really important to be international for solidarity. Um, and uh, Carl says, I think establishing different trading, economic and cultural connections, providing alternatives to existing economics um, is also vital. And of course, that's the work that Laurie is leading on um, our economy. Um, so I would certainly um, look at look at that um, and in some more depth. Adam, you had uh, your hand as well. Just one more thing, which is that um, I've been very struck by the way that people who aren't used to feelings of solidarity with their community are often in my experience really enjoying that at the moment but have been encouraged to label those feelings as a kind of national sentiment so i wrote a piece for example criticizing the queen's speech in the uk for, for doing exactly that for kind of wrapping the flag around a set of quite vulnerable feelings that we all have and naming them as kind of british rather than global and human and solidaristic and I got quite a lot of kickback from various of my friends, including some doctors saying, you know, I've been enjoying this rising national sentiment. And of course, the, the problem with that is that's how authoritarianism wins, is that they label a kind of positive feeling of solidarity that we all have 
as something to do with a kind of nation and therefore the state, and they use that feeling to discipline others and minorities and so on. So I think it's very important as we organize, continually push different narratives from the kind of nationalist narratives that states will give us and talk about how you know, we're in this together globally and we're in this together with you know, different kinds of people that actively include and give platforms to those who are going to be marginalized by those kind of processes of constructing nationalisms. So I think it's very important that we do that and we do that through building social movements and building alternative bases of power. And you're muted, Mary. Sorry, I keep doing this. <laughs> um, so many of uh, uh, the most important stories we're telling at the moment are common and universal and human, and we, we are noticing um, threads and patterns and trends uh, that cross borders and um, stories that um, uh, have common threads, whether they're in Ecuador or, or Uganda or um, Armenia um, or the UK. And um, there is something uh, quite alarming about the way that our government um, is uh, framing uh, this battle, as, as Lydia um, pointed out, this battle against um, the pandemic as some sort of great British war effort. Um, and, and indeed that myth of British exceptionalism has led uh, to a disastrous path where um, you know, bodies like the World Health Organization were ignored for far too long and we are now going to have the highest death rate in all of Europe, even though um, the crisis hit here uh, relatively late. Um, so this, off, these questions of, of um, um, how we do things and who we are and whether we're being patriotic and, and how we respond as a nation are actually often questions of life and death. And, and certainly the UK is experiencing that right now. Um, so thank you for making that point. Um, I am gonna wrap it up here. Um, thank you all so much for participating. Um, please continue to follow us on Twitter and Facebook um, in our newsletter. Um, and um, please uh, dial in next week um, for Laurie's uh, discussion about um, uh, how um, China might be re re remaking um, the global world order. And um, certainly that's a theme that's been picked up a couple of times uh, today. So um, yes, thank you for joining. Um, please support us, uh, Open Democracy, if you can. And please continue to read and listen and watch and, and discuss things with, with us. We really enjoyed having all of you participate. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.